I'm here with Frankie in Wicker Park in Chicago at, but is this Wicker Park? This is the park of Wicker Park, yeah. This is the park that comes after Wicker. Exactly, that's the one. And that's how <laughs> we start this episode, mm-hmm. if these things are even called episodes. Mm-hmm. The first thing that I ask everyone to kind of let out a pleasantry is what's on your mind. Ooh, what's on my mind is um, trying to not let, this has been a thing I've been thinking about the past few days, to not let the never-ending to-do list of bullshit in my mind take over my days. You know what I mean? Like, there's just this constant loop of, like, these little things that you have to do all the time. And I think, like, part of it is just because I'm moving around and stuff like that. Um, but to not let that overrule enjoying the day and, like, taking pauses to just be in the moment. So What would that look like to be in the moment? What does mm-hmm. that mean to you? I would say to s- just stop making to-do lists. I have a problem with to-do lists. <laughs> do you get I re- joy out of making them or do you get anxiety over not making them? I think, I think when I write them, I get joy out of them. Mm-hmm. And if I do them on my phone, they give me anxiety. So, <laughs> but why, why, why do you have this need to do to do lists? Is it because things actually need to be done, or because there's something that you're not wanting to face in terms of being present? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, I think like you know there are things that need to get done, but I think I they, it's not so urgent, you know. And I feel like this this obsession with like check 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 check, and it prevents me from just like looking around and like even being able to be creative and and that kind of thing if I get too sucked into things that don't actually urgently need to get done you know (laughs) when a train passes should we let it pass or should we talk over it it doesn't sound that loud to me it doesn't you think it's too loud also I love how I was I was deferring to you as the as the guest uh, well as the audio expert here (laughs) yeah yeah are you an audio expert no not at all I'm not either (laughs) I feel like you are I'm I'm good at playing characters. Mm, okay. Well, you yeah. definitely know more than me. But I'm not, not in a deceiving way. And like, mm-hmm. uh, it's not like I was saying I was. I yeah. just, I guess my behavior suggested it was. Gotcha. No, I mean, it doesn't sound that loud to me, but you definitely, it's your call. <laughs> okay. What, uh, what activities for you behavior wise do you think would be most likely to like bring on a present moment or suck you in there? Mm. Um, like other than music, Exercise is a big thing for me. I've been doing a lot of walks around here. I love just walking around. I've been biking a lot. I got a new used Schwinn bike that I've been loving. Uh, I got myself a Schwinn a while ago. Yeah. Oh, where is it? It's not on the van? It's uh, in Royal Oak. It didn't, oh, make, it didn't make the cut. Come on. You could have got a bike ride. I actually spent probably oh, no. 15 to 17 hours looking up bike racks. I bought a bike rack. I returned the bike rack. Oh, no. I was Why? racking my head around the idea of a bike rack. And why did you decide not to do it? I think ultimately I didn't want, I didn't want to make it, my van more of a target per se. Hmm. Um, I didn't want it to be obvious that like I was out and about living. Okay, why? I guess just because my whole life is in there and I didn't want like- Oh, like safety, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Probably being over over cautious. Yeah, no. Also, that makes sense. I lo- like that my license plate says thought. Mm. I does it thought T H O U T H zero U G H D. Yeah, that's that's not particularly <laughs> under and, the radar. <laughs> and I didn't want the bike to cover up the license the thought. plate. Is that's, that that's petty? legit? No, it's that petty. makes sense because you put a lot of thought into it. So. Actually, put no thought into it. <laughs> I was at the dealership, and they said, "What do you want?" And I said, "Is M E D I T eight meditate taken?" <laughs> and they're like, "Yeah, it is." Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, "How about thought?" Oh my god! And they're god, like, "No, it's one. open." I'm like, "I guess all right." Okay, yeah. I gotta check check it out. <laughs> we were talking, what a couple days ago about how you're reading Eckhart Tolle or Tolle. I think it's Mm -hmm. one of the two. Yeah. And you're reading A New Earth, and you you said you're hyper-focused on this idea of past, present, and future. Yeah. I wanted to know if you could elucidate a little bit what each of those three sentiments, past, present, future, mean to you at the moment. Yeah. 
I mean, I think that's part of why, you know, you said what's on my mind and that's been on my mind a lot. I'm just trying really to be more in the moment. So um, I've been thinking about this idea that we discussed about like why it is that we're so fixated on the past and the future. And to me, I kind of think it's because we know that it's outside of our control and it's almost like an unbearable amount of responsibility to be in the present because we know that there's something that we can be doing about it. Right. You know, whether that's like, you know, taking a deep breath or closing your eyes or being grateful for things or actually in a larger sense, like going after your goals and being honest with yourself about what it is that you want or being really honest about your relationships and priorities and that kind of thing. It's just a lot. Um, but it's very liberating to... What, so. to be in the present? Yeah. Yeah, I also think as, as like, if we're going to involve the mind, like, the only thing the mind could think about is the past and the future. Mm-hmm. Because is their mind involved in the present? Like, it mm, for me, right. maybe there is. But I feel like when mind gets involved in the present, it's after the present moment happened, and then the mind is saying, how good was that present moment, which is technically a past moment. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. I mean, what about, like, sensation, though? Like, would you consider that the present, like, or part of the mind? You know what I mean? Like, the yeah. things that you're feeling? Because that's, yeah. to me, when I'm, like, my version of meditation and being in the moment is, like, feeling, you know... My what's on my skin and Physical. what I'm hearing in that moment. Oh, so right. like like t- like senses like hearing and yeah, yeah. Would you consider that like of the mind? No, I guess I wouldn't. Yeah. Although more. that is being neurons are firing, causing that. Yeah. I guess I was thinking of like mind in terms of thought. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Th- thinking about something means it's already happened, and you're reflecting on it, <laughs> or. Those things yeah. I think would be, like, if there's a such thing as a spirit or a soul or, like, the mm-hmm. unknown, the ineffable, that might be closer to that. Even though it is happening in the mind, I feel like whatever the present moment is, it's getting in touch with something outside of ourselves. hmm Yeah. Do you believe that there's something outside of the brain and yourself? Yeah, I do. I also read this really good book over quarantine called um, Here All Along by Sarah Hurwitz. Oh, Definitely. I, I have was you heard a meditation of this? retreat with Sarah oh, a couple you were? years ago. No, what? Like with her, with her? In oh, a, no, no. Like, sh- I think we just got partnered up for a, for an eye-gazing exercise. Oh, no, but so she was there. I yeah, don't know if you she meant she, like, led it virtually. No, or she was a participant. There uh, it was, like, a Jewish meditation retreat up in Maryland. No way. But, yeah, I, you I, gotta tell I me saw about that, that she released that book, and I haven't read it yet. I'm going to, I should give it to you. Yeah. I, I have it with me. It was, it's really beautiful. And I think I was kind of struggling with my views on religion and reading that book was mm. very insightful and like thinking about, yeah, God being something more than God that we were taught and it being more about like a spirit or a co- inner connectivity. And yeah, so I do, I definitely believe I in that. also <laughs> go through uh, have gone through some serious struggles with mm-hmm. religion. Um, what What are some, when you mention struggles, like what are you alluding to? Um, just not, yeah, I think I was just stuck in this mindset of God as we were taught it in, you know, Hebrew school and <laughs> Jew, Jewish day school and that kind of thing. Um, and just not, you know, I was taking everything too literally. And mm. I think that's something she talked about a lot in her, talks about a lot in her book, like taking the stories and the Torah too literally. And I was like, okay, well, if I want to really understand it, I need to read the Torah, which I mean, I think is cool and respectable and all that. But still, as I'm reading them, I'm like, I'm not getting that much out of this, you know, but to me, like the prayers are really special and just thinking about them more as metaphors. So, yeah, I think just designing my own, like, way of thinking about it. When we talk about, what I mean, Abraham Joshua Heschel, um, a prominent Jewish figure from the past, used to talk about the word ineffable, which was, like, this mm-hmm. idea that it's, like, what can't be articulated. It's the unknown, what, mm-hmm. what can't be put into words. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of the time 
music or any creative endeavor mm -hmm. does that for me. Yeah. Like, I don't want to say that creativity is a religion per se, but creativity might access what religion also can access. Yeah. For you personally, what is, what are some of the creative mechanisms that help to access that space for you? Mm, totally. I agree. I think creating with other people, most especially, and, you know, doing anything with other people, like whether it's you know, dance or making music or anything is such a um, larger than life experience. And that to me is like the essence of spirituality, like being in sync with another person. And of course, like there are ways that you can access spirituality just on your own. But I think that's a super special expression of it. Um, so yeah, jamming with other people, writing with other people. And then personally, for some reason, I think because I grew up playing classical piano, practicing classical piano just gets me in the zone and, mm. you know, in flow and it helps me write a lot. Even if it's only for a really short, even if it's like 10, 20 minutes to just play some old pieces or learn a little bit of a new uh, classical piece, that helps me. What do you think it is about a bit? the piano, the instrument itself? Like how did, if you were to dive like really intricate, really deep into mm -hmm. the piano as an instrument or as a living being, what mm -hmm. about it? What about it does that for you? Oh, wow. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if I could say about the instrument, but I think ab about classical piano, what it is that does that is that it's just so difficult. <laughs> that it's just so all consuming. And it's like, you know, it's like running, like running is so hard that all you can do is just like move your legs. You know, you don't have the capacity Right. Once you are doing it for long enough or getting your heart rate up enough, like you don't have the capacity to be thinking. And when you're really dedicating yourself to learning a classical piece, you can't be thinking. You can't be having all these distractions, you know. And as I mentioned, like I'm constantly distracted. I think a lot of people are constantly distracted. And it's just so nice to have something that doesn't allow for that, <laughs> you know. So It's interesting that you mentioned the word distraction because there was a certain lyric in the record you just released I apologize if I botch it but I'm at uh, least going to get the sentiment yeah. that I wanted to ask you about but I well I kind of have questions about it but I also mm -hmm. want to see what happens when I say it and then I want to see how you respond to it by like <laughs> just basically telling me like either where that lyric came from or what mm -hmm. you meant or maybe it was a metaphor mm -hmm. but it was I'm distracted trying to circumvent the truth mm -hmm. first of all I just like the word circumvent so Thank I was drawn you. to it but also I'm uh, as very interested in the idea of I mean you meant circumvent as in like go around right mm -hmm. and like yeah mm -hmm. so like the idea of walking around the truth or being I, I'm, I'm really passionate about I mean one I, I don't like lying and mm -hmm. I think that's one way that we can get to become better beings mm -hmm. but what were you talking about in that line and then to follow it up you were talking about also being distracted about trying to get your mind off someone to what extent was the truth that you were trying to get around have to do with the the person you were talking about. Mm, That's, yeah. There was a lot there. No, no. First yeah. of all, thank you for knowing that lyric. <laughs> thank you. Um, I yeah. So it, the the whole line is um, I can't focus on these pages that I'm reading. Couldn't tell you if you asked me what they're meaning. I'm distracted trying to keep my mind off you, or distracted trying to circumvent the truth. Distracted trying to keep my mind off you. Right. So I think it literally was like I was reading and I couldn't focus and then I just like kind of sang that line and that's how the songs started. Oh. And that just kept on happening because I was having some relationship issues and it was just so, I was so frustrated that I couldn't like do anything intellectually <laughs> for myself because I was so distracted by this like emotional issue. But I think it also was about the fact that the a problem with the relationship was um, this person was so brilliant and so smart and that was something I really loved about them and we were always talking about like all this crazy stuff and, and politics and science and whatnot and um, he had a lot of trouble talking about emotions and feelings and that mm -hmm. ended up being kind of the problem and then I felt like I had started to drift into that mindset too, you know, and... Of not having as much emotion? Or I definitely had it, but thinking that it was acceptable to, to suppress it, it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and not talk about certain things that are important, you know, and, um, and then interestingly, I felt like 
in the worlds that was kind of happening too. Like we were all getting into these really nitty gritty arguments and factual Mm. arguments and not talking about like values, you know, and the emotional, personal aspect of things. So long answer. That's where that line (laughs) came from. What do you think about, maybe you don't have an answer to that, which is great. But when I heard that line too, I just thought of like all the ways in which circumvent the truth could be applied. Do you think beyond Mm -hmm. just like your personal relationship that that came out of, do you think that line has any broader meaning as well in terms of the way we live our lives? Yeah, all the time. I I think people constantly do that and I'm not pointing fingers. Like I do it too. You know, it's so easy to just like fill up our lives and minds and time, you know, with things um, that, that we know are preventing us from getting at the real problem or addressing our real challenge or feelings about things. And for some reason, that's okay, you know? Like, we've been made to think that that's okay, you know, to, to not, like, talk about what's difficult and vulnerable for us. Like, in our everyday conversations, we're not, we're not talking about such deep things. We're not putting ourselves in vulnerable, vulnerable positions a lot of the times, you know? Like, I think a lot of people whether it's social media or your resume or whatever, like you want to make yourself sound like you've got it together and things are going well for you. Um, and, and they're not all the time, you know. I feel like I'm all over the place here. <laughs> That's what this whole concept is about. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> the idea but, is that we talk about things so where each of us get to think our, think our thoughts in public and sort out our mind yeah. in public <laughs> with each other and in public. Cause cool. We don't, I don't, I don't have everything figured out. And half the time I'm on here, I'm trying to sort out my thoughts. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> what about your music is for you? Mm-hmm. And what about your music is for other people's consumption? And I don't, mm-hmm. like, to me, I actually don't place a value judgment on the idea of producing art for other people to enjoy. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And maybe it's both. But I wonder, like, what fuels you more? Is it that expression of artistic energy and then as soon as the record uh, is out it's like all right i'm just ready to express myself again yeah and people are like oh i love the record and you're like i don't want to talk about the record like right. i've been working on that record for six months yeah that's so and, true you know <laughs> and like but then you know then that's their first time seeing it so or mm-hmm. do you get so much gratification from when people finally hear the record and you get to see it through their lenses and then it's reflected back at you like a mirror yeah like what which of those two bring you more joy or is it kind of symbiotic Wait, which of those two bring me more joy yeah, as the, in... the writing of the record, the, oh. the, the, the exploration of the self and the world and, and putting that into art, or is it the witnessing other people experience your art and then explain that back to you? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I want people to like my music, you know, and I, I think it is good to make sure that that doesn't override you wanting to like your music or just creating to create for like intrinsic fulfillment, but I am not like modest about saying I want it to be like commercially enjoyed, you know? And I, and I think also I just, I listened to a lot of pop music growing up. So I do already kind of have like a pop ear and my, and my music sounds like pop music. Um, but I, I agree that, um, is as much as while you're working on it, you're hoping, and especially before the release, you're hoping that people are going to like it and it's going to go well and listen to it. Um, once it's out, it's it's like, you're right. It's like, okay, I'm over it, <laughs> you know? And like, I can't wait to start writing some new music and working on the next thing. Yeah. Um, I think like performing, it's really fulfilling to see people, you know, be moved by your music. Mm. But in terms of like releasing something, it's special when someone tells me like, like you just said, like a certain lyric resonated with them or that I know that, you know, they connected with it, but it's never so fulfilling to hear like it was good or, or no amount of like numbers is ever super fulfilling, you know? Yeah. I'm wildly curious as I was listening to it. And I also just like, like kind of reminiscing in a nostalgic way about mm-hmm. music that we loved. Mm-hmm. Um, but is, were there, either artists from your childhood or current ones slash Mm -hmm. was there like some art or book 
or movie or film or anything that you were consuming at the time that definitely left an imprint on this record or that mm -hmm. was moving through you as an influence? Or did you purposefully shut out influences, at least consciously, so that you could really try and not kind of mm -hmm. be interrupted by other yeah. influence? Yeah. I think it's really interesting that a lot of artists do that where they, like, deliberately try not to listen to music. I probably should do that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, sp I'm split on it because I still yeah. think subconsciously. Yeah, I mean, it's still in all there. All our ideas are informed somehow. Yeah. But yeah. maybe there's something to it. I don't know. Yeah, but I definitely, you know, like, especially because I had my friend produce this one, um, whereas, like, the last one I just did super, like, in my room. I did all the, you know, recording and mixing and mastering. So, um, but for this one, I, like, literally made a Spotify playlist oh. of, like, the soundscape that I wanted it to sound like. Um, so, like, Madison Cunningham, no, no. Who Are You Now? She's wonderful. Um, Sarah Bareilles, Amidst the Chaos. Um, Phoebe Bridgers, Stranger in the Alps. Emily King, The Seven EP. Um, so those, I think, were like the four main sounds that were shaping it. And what about beyond sound and sonic? What about uh, like lyric or mm -hmm. general messaging? Yeah. Where, where did that come from? Was that a compilation of different stuff you've written over the years? Was that mm. was the whole record themed around an idea? Was it a kind of a, a smattering of different songs that you felt sonically worked together, but the messaging wasn't necessarily meant to be mm -hmm. coherent? Where was it for you? Gotcha. Yeah, I think the messaging was definitely like intentional and cohesive. Um, so it so it's called "Put Up Your Walls," which is a a line from the Weave Our Lives, the song we were just talking about. Yep. Um, and it's, yeah, it's about this idea of vulnerability. So the songs, I mean, it, you know, it moves from like relationships to like spirituality in the afterlife um, to like family things. But I think all together, it's just about being vulnerable, you know, and like struggling with change and growth and challenges and like being open about that and exploring like why is it that it's so difficult to be open about it <laughs> so. what's what's something if you were to write another lp or an ep mm -hmm. what's something an aspect of the whole writing process or the soundscape um that you feel like you didn't get to achieve or didn't choose to achieve in this record that would challenge yourself in some way to try something new like what would mm -hmm. what would some kind of new approach for a new record look like mm -hmm. or are you going to really build off the exact kind of yeah. model you set no i i would really like to record an actual live you know ep or album uh with like all the band playing at once but mm. we did everyone separate just honestly because of scheduling like i was hoping for us to all play it together um but kind of because of COVID, like we were still recording this throughout March and April. Oh, wow. um, so then we had to get some home recordings and that kind of thing. And it's, so, I mean, so Jeff Brown uh, makes and mastered it and he's super talented and like it sounded really natural and everything, but I would really love to do a live recorded album. Yeah. What do you think it is about live music that, that changes the experience? It's so much more fun. <laughs> for you or yeah. for the listener? Oh, for me. For you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you think it's more fun recording Way live? More fun. Yeah. 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 Um, I think, like, especially because, yeah, so I did classical piano and, like, I'm a singer songwriter and I feel a lot of times really, like, isolated in how I've done music. And I always wish, like, and now it's a goal of mine to, like, jam with people more and, you know, have a more consistent group of people that I play with performing and recording wise um, like Lake Street Dive is one of my favorite bands yeah. that is like would love that <laughs> yeah and they have <laughs> the like a lot of brass going and, yep, yeah yeah and the up I love an upright bass mm. so that's kind of what I'm slowly aiming for is there a something topically that is like hanging on your strings that you think when you go to write next is there like a certain area of exploration of the psyche that you think you might tackle next? Mm. It's a good question, but honestly, no. Like, I think right now I feel, I just feel super free. Mm. And and I, I think I've almost always in my life been so like project goal oriented, you know, and like 
now I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do mm. this. In the past two, yeah, they were very focused and um, like concrete. And now I'm, I just want to like let it happen, you know, and I don't, I don't know what it's going to be about or who or where or what, you know, but I really just want to like, I want to have fun. I want to have a little more fun with music, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and I like love this that jam. Sentiment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We spoke a lot about vulnerability. We spoke mm -hmm. a lot about past, present and future, both of which, and a lot of what we talked about kind of tap into what could be our optimal human nature if there was a such thing. So I'm going to finish with the final question that mm -hmm. is more of a thought experiment mm -hmm. than anything. Okay. Is our optimal human nature found in values of the past, promises of the future, mm -hmm. or is humanity a doomed enterprise? Ooh. <laughs> uh, and I have to pick one of those three. I, I didn't feel say like... what I didn't say anything <laughs> about have to. I mean they're all they're all necessary. I don't I don't think humanity is a doomed enterprise. Um, but again, I think that as a whole and individually, we are too focused on past and future. And I think that's maybe seems to be changing and seems to be like the, you know, the present uh, is coming more into the mainstream and emphasis on that is coming into the mainstream, which is wonderful. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, obviously history teaches a lot, teaches us a lot. Obviously, hope is important, you know, and what are we striving for um, in terms of, like, society, you know? But, yeah, I think it's exciting that the present is becoming more of a topic. So, not a doomed enterprise. Final answer. <laughs> Frankie, thank you for inviting me into your mind. I believe I was invited to your heart. If mm -hmm. I was, thank you for having me there. <laughs> and thank you for having me in Wicker Park. Yes. At the actual park in Wicker actual Park. Actual park. <laughs> thank you so much. Onwards. <laughs>